that uh, I would like to highlight few lines about our principal madam. Dr. Bonobina Brahmo is the 11th principal of Kukrajar Gop College. She did her graduation from Cotton College, what is measuring in history, and completed her MA in history from University of Pune. Dr. Brahmo completed her PhD from North Bengal University. Uh, Dr. Bonobina Brahmo has the experience of teaching at UG level for the last 22 years. Her doctoral thesis is in the field of incorporation and administration of sorry, Eastern Dwarfs region under the colonial rule. Kokrajar Gop College is lucky enough to get such a young and dynamic principal. I'd like to request Honorable Principal Madam to present her welcome address and inaugurate the webinar. Madam, please. Okay, thank you, Basanta, for uh, the introduction. And uh, at the very outset, I would like to uh, greet you with a very uh, warm good morning. Uh, Honorable speaker of today's webinar, Professor uh, Pradeep Kumar Fukan and uh, Professor uh, Prashad. Professor Prashad, most welcome, photo of you, sir. And, uh, the coordinator IQAC, Mrs. Anjali Bosumachari, the HOD of Department of Chemistry, Kokaja Government College, Dr. Boshanta Kumar Das, faculty members of the Department of Chemistry, Kokaja Government College, other faculty members, esteemed guests who have joined us from different institutions all over the country for this webinar, my dear students, researchers, and their uh, colleagues. Uh, at the very outset, I do welcome all of you to this webinar, national semi uh, webinar on application of uh, spectroscopy in analytical chemistry. As a layman, we do not have a much knowledge about uh, this uh, uh, spectroscopy. Uh, this is uh, very much a subject related uh, thing and uh, uh, I hope today's seminar will bring a different dimension of the use of spectroscopy in analytical chemistry and uh, our students will benefit a lot from that. Uh, we have PG courses in chemistry in the college and I do believe the student of PG course will immensely benefit from these courses and uh, from this webinar. And uh, with these words, uh, I do declare today's webinar to be open. And once again, welcome all of you on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Vasanta. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Kukrajar Gop College, uh, uh, Professor Bonobina Brahmo, who is the 11th principal of Kukrajar Gop College, 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 Kukrajar Gop College,
to share her views. Madam is also an well-known poet in Bodo literature and the recipient of Shaito Academy Award for her book, Ang Mavroi Dang Dasang, Don't Ask Me How Do I Do, a collection of poems in the year 2016. Madam passed her matriculation in 1979 from Kukrajar Girls HSE School and completed MSc from Nehu, Shillong in 1994. She joined as lecturer at Kokrajar Golf College in the year 1995. Now she is associate professor and head of the department of physics, Kokrajar Golf College. Madam, please share your views. Thank you, Vasanta. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes. yes madam. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Honorable principal of Kokrajar Government College, Dr. Bonavina Brahma. Most respected resource persons, Professor Pradeep Fukan of the Department of Chemistry, Kohati University, and Dr. Kamalesh Prasad, Senior Principal Scientist of CSIR, Bhavanagar, Gujarat. And my dear fellow colleague, Dr. Basanta Kumar Das, HOD of Chemistry, and my esteemed participants and dear students. A, a warm welcome to you all from Colonel Quality Assurance Cell of Cockroach Government College. This is the sixth webinar we are organizing during the time of pandemic. Since we cannot have contact classes, meetings, and seminars in this difficult time of Corona, we have to adopt online mode of classes, meetings, and webinars for this reason, the internal quality assurance cell decided to organize a series of webinars. And for the smooth conduct of this, constituted a webinar committee. Starting from 2nd August, we have been organizing national and international webinars in various topics and have come up with planning of as much as 10 webinars in the month of August. For that, our webinar committee members, especially the technical team, is working relentlessly day and night. Today's webinar is on the topic, application of spectroscopy in analytical chemistry. This is a very important topic and multidisciplinary in nature. This topic will interest the faculty members, research scholars, and students, not only from chemistry, but also from physics and other related subjects. Because spectroscopy study is a very important laboratory tool for scientific studies and researches. Moreover, the topic is very relevant in the sense that it has got application in various fields in agriculture and food industry, pharmaceutical analysis and medical field, forensic science, and many more applications related to organic chemistry. I have, I hope the participants will be benefited from today's webinar, which will be presented by our learned speakers. And I personally look forward to know the recent developments in spectroscopy study and wish a grand success to of today's webinar. Thank you. Over to. Uh, thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Now, it is the time to move to the main part of the webinar. I'd like to request Professor Pradeep Fukansar to present his valuable speech. Before that, I'd like to highlight a few lines about Professor Fukun. Professor Pradeep Fukun completed his graduation from Science College, Zohar in the year 1989 under Dibrugarh University, MSc from Guwahati University in the year 1992, a PhD from NCL Pune in the year 1999. Then he joined as a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry, Gohat University. Now he is professor of the department. Professor Fukon is involved in many academic ad and administrative activities. He is coordinator of Gohat University IPR cell from 2013 till date. Presently, he is joint secretary, a chemical research society of India. Convener Chemical Research Society of India, any chapter. 
Secretary Society for Chemical Education, Asham, Member Executive Committee, Indian Society for Surface Science and Technology, Member Research Council, Bodolan University, Member Board of Postgraduate Studies in Chemistry in Mizoram University, Nagaland University, Nehu, NIT, Nagaland, and as to Assam State uh, te uh, Technical University. He was member of governing bodies of different colleges like Moirabari College, Jagirat College, Dispur College. He was board member of National Chemistry Olympiad examination in the year 2010, 15, and 19. He is reviewer of several journals published by American Chemical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, Elsevier, Wille, Tim, Taylor and Francis, B uh, Bentham Science, CSIR, NISCIR, etc. He was an associate editor of Journal of Assam Science Society. He is member of Institutional Academic Integrity Panel and Academic Council, Guwahati University. He is life member of Chemical Research Society of India, Catalysis, Catalysis Society of India, Indian Society for Sur Surface Science and Technology, Association of Chemistry Teachers India, Assam Science Society, Science for Chemical Education, Assam, and Orissa Chemical Society. Professor Foucault's research interest includes cross-suppling reaction, carbon hydrogen and carbon-carbon bond activation, nitrine transfer reaction, use of sulfonamide-based reagents in organic synthesis, new synthetic methods using homogeneous, heterogeneous, and nanocatalyst, synthesis of heterocycles, asymmetric synthesis of bioactive molecules, computational studies on organic reactions. As principal investigator, investigator and co-principal investigator, he has undertaken so many projects. His articles were published in more than 134 journals. <clears throat> Total number of <clears throat> citations uh, is more than uh, two, 2,809. Till now, 28 scholars obtained PhD degree under his guidance, and currently six scholars are pursuing PhD under his guidance. Large numbers of awards, fellowships, and honors are received by Professor Foucault. Some of them are Fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, FRSC UK, in the year 2017, Bronze Medal from Chemical Research Society of India in the year 2013, Alexander von uh, Humboldt Fellowship for Postdoctoral Research, Germany, uh, in the year 2002 to 2003, he revisits in the year 2007, 2009, and 2010, Ramanna Fellowship, DST India, in the year 2007 to 2010, Best Chemistry Teacher Award, Tata Chemicals, ACT, CII, and RAC in the year 2013, represented the Indian delegation as a mentor for 47th International Chemistry Olympiad held at Baku, Azerbaijan during uh, July. Uh, 2015, represented the Indian delegation as a mentor for 46th International Chemistry Olympiad held at Hanoi, Vietnam uh, in the year 2014. Professor H.C. Bhuya Award, uh, Asham Science Society in the year 2013. Highly cited paper uh, for the year 2018 from RSC for the publication uh, chemical communications in the year 2016. Most cited paper 2004 to 7 award tetrahedron letters 2004, LCBR UK 2007. Top cited papers for 11, 2011 to 12, Journal of Molecular Catalysis A chemi Chemical in 2011. Jan Burwa Memorial Science Award, Assam Science Society, Jorhat Branch 2008. BM Das Memorial Science Award, Assam 2009. Uh, Samasri uh, Gupta Memorial Young Scientist Award in the year 2011. We have such an eminent personality, researcher, and educationist among, amongst us. We are eagerly waiting to hear you, sir. Uh, so please start your presentation. Sir. Good morning. Good morning. So you could see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prasanna Das, for your 
kind introduction. And uh, I first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Banavina Brahmo, Principal Praja Government College, and uh, Mrs. Anjali Basumachari, Coordinator IQSCC, for giving me an opportunity to interact with you. Uh, today, I'll talk about application of NMR spectroscopy for structural elucidation. So this actually topic will most of the thing I, I basic things only will uh, I'll cover so that it will brush up your memories. So you can see. Uh, so let us uh, analyze the name. Uh, so this is uh, nuclear. It uh, relates to nucleus. Magnetic. It relates to magnet. Resonance. It may, uh, relates to frequency. Spectroscopy, it relates to electromagnetic radiation and many. So we perform an experiment on a nuclei of atoms, not the electrons. So this, the nucleus must have a magnetic property because it, uh, it concerns its magnetic property. And we need to attain a resonating frequency of a nucleus by exposing it to second magnet. And this should result in transition or radiation. So. And finally, analysis of this phenomenon gives the NMR spectrum. So, first question is, can we observe magnetism with all uh, nuclei? So, basically, the answer is no. So, but why? It's because uh, it's of the property called nuclear spin. So, nucleus have um, non-zero spin can show magnetism. So, subatomic particles electrons, protons, and neutrons can be imagined as a spinning on their axis. In many atoms, such as uh, 12 carbon, and these spins appear against each other, such that the nucleus of the atom has no overall spin. However, in some atoms, such as proton and 13 carbon, the nucleus does possess an overall spin. So if the number of neutrons, so, so this is the term rule for determining the net spin of a nucleus. If the number of neutrons and the number of protons are both even, then the nucleus has no spin. If the number of neutrons plus the number of protons is odd, then the nucleus has half integral spin. For example, half 3 by 2, 5 by 2, etc. If the number of neutrons and number of protons are both are odd, then the nucleus has the indices, like deuterium, etc. Forty nitrogen. So the overall spin i is important. It is a quantized property. According to quantum mechanics, a nuclear spin, nucleus of spin i, will have two i plus one possible orientations. A nucleus with spin half will have two possible orientations, obviously. In the absence of external magnetic so field, and these orientations are have equal energy. If the magnetic field is applied, then the energy level splits. You can see here, if each level is given a magnetic quantum number m, and here you see when the magnetic field is not applied, so both the uh, energy levels, these spins, and they have same energy. Once the energy is applied, uh, then they split into two parts. So it gives m is equal to minus half plus half. So the possible magnetic quantum states of nuclei, <coughs> i is equal to half, m is equal to minus half and plus half. So these are the examples proton, <coughs> tritium, then 13C, 13 carbon, 15 nitrogen, 19F, 31P. So these are the nucleus, nuclei having i is equal to half. And i is equal to 1, m is equal to minus 1, 0, and plus 1, there are three states. So it is deuterium, then 14. Then i is equal to 3 by 2, it has 5, uh, 4, uh, this one. Levels, then lithium, boron, 11 boron, 17O, 33 S. So basically, you see here the possible orientation of nuclear magnet in the magnetic field. So if you have a I is equal to half, then it will one will be aligned with the magnetic field, and one will be in the opposite direction of the magnetic field. So this gives m plus half and m plus half. 
And if you have i is equal to one, then one particular uh, state will have alignment with the magnetic field direction. Then one will be uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field direction, and one will have opposite to the magnetic field direction. So when the metal nucleus is in a magnetic field, the initial population of the energy levels are determined by thermodynamics as it has by the Boltzmann distribution. This is well known, this Boltzmann distribution. Now, and that lower energy level N plus will contain slightly more nuclear than the higher level. So, this is the population energy difference between these two states. So, this, this will give the population in the energy level. It is possible to excite these nuclei into the higher level with electromagnetic radiation in radio frequency rates, and the frequency of radiation needed is determined by the difference in energy between the obviously so this is very well known this is the LHD. and this uh, signal in an hour spectroscopy results from the difference between the energy absorbed by the spin which makes the transition from the low energy state to the higher energy state and, 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 and energy emitted by the spin which simultaneously makes the transition from higher energy state to the lower energy state. <clears throat> the signal is thus proportional to the population difference between the states. The NMR is rather a sensitive spectroscopy. It is a resonance or exchange of energy at a specific frequency between the spins and the spectrum, which gives the NMR its sensitivity. <clears throat> the nucleus has a positive charge and a spinning. And this generates a small magnetic field. So since the nucleus is spinning, so it generates actually the magnetic field. So this nucleus therefore possesses a magnetic moment, mu, which is proportional to its spin. Mu is equal to gamma i h by 2 pi. The constant gamma is called magnetogyric ratio or gyromagnetic ratio. So ratio of the magnetic dipole moment and angular. So these are the different magnetic directions. Proton 42, 13C, 10, 10.7, 14N, 3.07, 31P, 17.2. <coughs> Basically, see if, uh, if we apply the same field, magnetic field, so this nuclei will experience different magnetic field at their nucleus because they have a this values are different. So this is a common uh, this is necessary dependence of sp states and magnetic moments. You see here this proton and deuterium. So this is deuterium has a magnetic moment difference is very high and exactly the same magnetic direct ratio is also quite significantly <coughs> different. <Please go. coughs> Therefore so this chart is very important for us because we simply say that when we measure magnet uh, NMR uh, spectrum of a particular compound, then we generally do it in detuited chain just because of these features. So when we apply magnetic field for protons, then uh, uh, sorry, for measuring the proton NMR or c NMR, which has a spin of half, you can see here. And so this is the difference uh, that makes it. Then this energy of a particular energy level is given by E is equal to this. And where B is the strength of the magnetic field, I think it is. And the difference in energy between levels and the tensile energy can be found. And this is well-known uh, equation. This means that magnetic field B is increased, so that is increased. So if the magnetic field uh, is increased, then the energy difference between the level can be also increased. It also means that if a nucleus has a relatively large magnetic direct ratio, then delta E is correspondingly large. So let's see let us select a nucleus spin of half is in a magnetic. And this nucleus is in the lower energy level, 
that is the magnetic moment does not oppose to electric field. I hope you remember about uh, this uh, this one. So the nucleus is spinning on its axis. In the presence of a magnetic field, the axis of rotation will precise around the magnetic field. So this is the precision of it. And this frequency of precision is termed as a lower frequency. And which is identical to the transition frequency. So lower frequency is identical to the transition frequency, which is defined by E to H. The potential energy of the processing nucleus is given by E. This is potential energy of precision nucleus. This is given by E is equal to minus mu B plus theta. So depending on the theta, we will have different potential energy. Of course, we will be the energy is absorbed by the nucleus, then the angular precision theta will change. See? And for a nucleus of spin half, absorption of radiation flips the magnetic moment so that it opposes the magnetic You can see when it is a flipping of the magnetic moment. So that means it goes to the higher energy state. That is just a transition. When the population of the higher and lower energy level becomes equal, no further absorption of radiation, then we say that spin system is situated. Then the relaxation process starts. That means once the situation of the spin system is achieved, then again those relaxation processes start, which will return the nuclei to the lower energy. So that means they will start emitting radiation or somehow they will reduce, they will uh, release their energy to get back to the ground state. So this is, uh, this process is called relaxation process. So, but however, this, uh, since the emission of radiation is insignificant because of the probability of re-emission of photon rays with a keyword of frequency, at radio frequencies, re-emission is negative. So that is why a relaxation due to radiation we can just negative. However, there, that's why we consider Two major relaxation processes on spin lattice relaxation is long distance and spin spin relaxation is transfer spin. So there will be two types of relaxation on spin lattice and other is spin spin relaxation. So spin lattice relaxation is sample in which the nuclear held is called That means we have a solvent, we uh, dissolve the sample in a solvent. And then what will happen? So we uh, we measure the energy. So that solvent itself is called actually the lattice. And the nuclei in the lattice are in vibrational and rotation motion, which creates a complex magnetic field. And the magnetic field caused by the motion of nuclei within the lattice is called lattice field. So this lattice field has a many components. So these components of the lattice field can interact with the nuclei. In the higher energy state, because they have in excess of energy, so that's why they can interact with that higher energy state, okay, and they cause them to lose it because they will get energy from the nuclei having higher energy state, and then finally they will return to the lower. Energy. The energy that a nucleus uses increases the amount of vibration and rotation within the lattice, resulting in a tiny rise in the temperature. So that is why that sample temperature. So then, so these components of nuclear field, so that's basically you see here, so when we radiate in terms of nuclear field, so we excite the nuclei to higher energy level, then somehow that nuclei get back to the lower level. So and this is spin like this. And this relaxation time T1, the average lifetime of the nuclei in a high energy state, is dependent on the magnetic ratio of the gas and the mobility of the nucleus. So mobility increases, the vibrational rotation of frequency increases, making it more likely for the component. And they are able to interact with the excited. However, at extremely high mobilities, the probability of component of plate is filled being able to interact with the excitability. So that's why, so it's dependent on the mobility of the lattice. 
then this is spin spin relaxation actually in this case just a uh, transfer of energy to the neighboring spin spin nuclei uh, relaxation describes the interaction between the neighboring nuclei with the identical precision frequencies but different magnetic quantities in this situation the nuclei can exchange quantum states and nucleus in the lower energy level be excited and while the excited nucleus relaxes to the lower energy level. and there is no net change in the population of the energy state but the average lifetime of nucleus in the excited state will decrease so this will result in line growth that means we will have a plot of and so basically now we have uh, two processes uh, apart from this radiative processes is a non radiative processes relaxation processes so where the energy are transferred from the excited nuclei to the other part, other systems so the magnetic field at the nucleus is not equal to the nucleus now the question is whether all kind of nucleus all kind of nuclei will experience the same magnetic for a magnetic field for a particular applied magnetic field only so basically it is not because of the environment of the nucleus you can see here the magnetic field at the nucleus is not equal to the applied magnetic field the nucleus the electrons around the nucleus so basically if you consider this a nucleus always there will be electron around the nucleus so they makes they makes a silk and the difference between the applied magnetic field and field at the nucleus is found as nucleus, nucleus. So basically, like electrons around the nucleus seals the, uh, this nucleus. So that is why magnetic field felt by a particular nucleus is dependent on the electronic environment around the nucleus. So hence, magnetic field of a nucleus is generally less than the applied field by a fact. So, see, so this sigma is. So it's dependent on the electron environment around the surrounding nucleus. And then, say so consider as electron of the moment. They have a spherical symmetry and circular the applied field and producing a magnetic field which opposes the applied field. So this means that applied field strength must be increased for a nucleus to absorb at the transit. So this up field shift is termed as a diamagnetic so that means if the s orbital uh, as far as s for orbital is concerned so electrons will completely seal because it is spherical symmetry so that is why we have to apply more field than actually the if if we have uh, if you can imagine a uh, naked uh, uh, nucleus so where there is no electron so that actually magnetic field will be much less than the applied magnetic field in the electron. So electrons in pre-orbital have no spherical symmetry, so they produce comparatively larger magnetic fields and yes, this gives a low field. So this desilding is termed as a paramagnetic. So now we have a two shifts, one diamagnetic, where we need to apply more magnetic field, it's a field, and then another is diamagnetic field. Uh, sorry, paramagnetic field. We will have it. Uh, uh, that nucleus will have uh, experience more magnetic field than given exposed. And in proton NMR, pre orbitals play no part. Obviously, there is no pre orbitals, which is why only small range of chemicals. So this is important. In proton NMR spectrum, generally, one to ten or one to twelve maximum. And sometimes rarely cases where it goes below. So just because of that, because there is no pre-orbitals, and we can easily see effect of S electron on that in the by electron intersection. We can CS3, CS3 X. X become intrinsically electron negative. So the electron density around the proton is and they resonate at lower field strengths. And chemical shift is a function of the nucleus and its So chemical shift is a function of nucleus and So the chemical shift of a nucleus is different between the resonance frequency of the nucleus and the standard relative to the standard. 
So for proton enamor, the reference is actually this the tramethyl zero. So this is actually we will consider it to be zero for that very the chemical chips. So this is another important uh, factor why different proton gives different chemical chips. So consider okay, this is well known every every textbook. So this particular uh, compound is discussed methanol and methanol. Oh sorry, ethanol. So this is a methylene proton and this is a methyl. So what will happen? So this proton, uh, this particular carbon has two protons. This particular carbon has three protons, and here one. Proton. And actually, what happens? So this is the spectrum of a of ethanol, and this is a methyl triplet. So this particular methyl group shows triplet. This methylene pink shows a quartet, and this gives single. The enamor spectrum of ethanol shows methyl pink. Has been split into three peaks and the methylene peak split into four peaks. So this occurs because of there is a small interaction between the two groups of protons. So this uh, we'll discuss a little more here. You can see here. So this is a methyl peak. Uh, peak. You can see here. Once you apply a field, then this spins two spins of two different uh, protons. Either they will oppose the magnetic field. Or they will be aligned in the magnetic field, and in this case, there are two orientations. So total four orientations, but these two particular orientations, uh, orientations have same energy. So you will have one, two. So in the first possible combination, speeds are paired. That will be discussed. So finally, what happens? That is the reason why methyl peak is split into three with ratio of yes to one. Which methyl peak? So you can see here. So this methyl peak is affected by these two particles. And at the same way, these two particular proton is affected by three methyl, three protons. And this, uh, and you see here, this is a methyl peak. So one orientation, three orientation, three orientation, one orientation. So to tell eight possible speed combinations, and it will split into 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So why 3 is to 3 is to 1? So now you could understand that there are 3 or in this one have same. And the first order spectrum where chemical shift between the interacting group are much larger than the okay? interpretation of splitting pattern is quite straight. It is very simple. But however, in other cases, so there will be change. The multiplicity of the if a multiplet is given by the number of equivalent protons in neighboring atoms, plus one, plus one. So, but it is very important, protons equivalent protons. So, this is very important. If the protons does not have an equivalent environment, then even they are attached to the same carbon, they make, they give further splitting the signal uh, near to the carbon. So equivalent liquid does not interact with each other. So that is a three methyl proton original cost splitting of the neighboring. The coupling constant is not dependent on the effect. So then multiplets can be easily distinguished from closely spaced singlets. So this is the multiplicity ratio: singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet, sextet, and septet. So this series is called the Pascal triangle. It can be calculated from the coefficients of the expansion of the equation. This is a con uh, so now we can have a two kind of uh, MR uh, experiments: one continuous wave and MR experiment, and the other one is uh, Fourier transform and MR experiment. So generally, nowadays continuous wave and MR experiments are almost obsolete because it gives very broad MR spectrum. So that is why we generally do not go. Wave animal machines. Now all the animal machines are Fourier transform animal machines. We have only one actually in our department in 1990 we had one continuous wave animal spectrum still lying in our ground. There is a continuous wave animal spectrum.
and now at present we have a ft hydrophobic spectrum so now we can have depending on the experiment type of experiment we can have two different dynamic spectrophotometer as well as two kind of experiments rather continuous NMR uh, experiment and then Fourier transform. So in this case, in the uh, continuous experiment, so a constant frequency which is continuously on the probe of energy levels while the energy level is free. And the continuous wave experiment can also be performed with a constant frequency is so you can have either frequency is constant or maintenance. So now it is FT and So this is important. The time domain and So in this case, actually FT and we just change from time domain to frequency domain or frequency domain to time domain. So this is pulse and spectroscopy, which is what we can say. Signal is detected after the maintenance vectors are rotated into X. What's the mechanism vector? So this is the figure. Mechanism vector is changed to x plane. So once the mechanism vector is in a x plane, it rotates about the direction of the view field that the axis. See here. So this is an x plane. It rotates the from m zero to m. <coughs> As transverse mechanism rotates about the z axis, it will reduce. Induce the current to be coil located under x. So fi finally, the plotting the current okay, in the coil. So basically, so this is the actually NMR as well. You have to plot the current experienced by the oscillator coil as a function of time, which gives you a sine wave. And Fourier transform is a mathematical technique. For converting time domain to the frequency domain. Now we have already here current as a function of time. That means we have a time domain spectrum. Then once we do FT, so this is the equation. So which gives, so this I will just skip, uh, which gives what happens, uh, gives the frequency domain. So uh, spectrum. The magnetization vector starting at x axis is rotated around the axis in a clockwise direction. The plot of mx as a function of time is, is a cosine wave, and the plot of my as a function of time is sine wave. And the solution of the is to input both mx and my into ft. ft is designed to handle two orthogonal input functions called the real and imaginary components. So finally, we go for FID. Fourier test from NMR, a free induction decay is observable NMR signal generated by non equilibrium nuclear spin mechanism process precising about a magnetic This non equilibrium mechanism is generally created by applying the pulse region, region and radio frequency close to the normal frequency. So obviously, it has to resonate with the normal frequency of the nucleus. So that is why we have to apply a particular frequency. If the metallization vector has non-zero component in x y plan, then the precision metallization will induce the corresponding slightly voltage in a detection coil surrounding the sample. And the time domain signal is typically utilized. So basically, so this free inductor, uh, induction decay, first uh, we get FID, we generally call it a FID signal, free induction decay. So a time domain signal is typically this is uh, this is that. So basically application. So then uh, we talk about of course FID signal. I will show you. And this is uh, an MR machine. This obviously I got from Wikipedia. Uh, <coughs> this is a magnet. There will be a magnet inside. So field lock, sim coils, sample probe, RF coils, gradient coils, then quadrature detector. So digital field. So these are detectors, hidden calls, RF calls, sample probe. So a sample probe in the top is a magnet. And finally, there will be obviously in the machine, there will be a, nowadays, of course, this is a very old machine. Now there will be different machines nowadays. And this is the FID signal we obtain from the NMR 
after doing the NMR spectrum. So basically, we do not get whatever NMR spectrum we see. So that actually is not that machine has generated. So machine has generated this FNC. So this is the original signal that has been generated out of our NMR spectrum. Then when we do the, this is a time domain uh, spectrum, and when we do the Fourier transform, then just we got this. So this is a very bad error spectrum. You can see here, it is appears at the same FID signal we have transform. So then what happens? This we have to uh, further we do some uh, scrutiny to get the actual error spectrum we see in our. So this is the NMR tube. Another sample is prepared in a thin wall glass tube, this is an NMR tube. And when placed in a magnetic field, the NMR active nuclei, such as proton and carbon, absorb at a frequency characteristic of the isotope. So, depending on the isotope, like proton and C tube, so they will absorb at the proton. The resonant frequency, the energy of the absorption, and the intensity of the signal are proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So I think I have to be a little bit fast. Uh, so this one, uh, this is a sample here. So we have I think uh, there is some network problem from uh, Fukon sir. So I request the participants to keep patience. Yeah, actually, there is a power cut. So, <laughs> yes, So uh, there is some problem from uh, Kupan sir due to power cut, I think. So I request, I'm requesting all the participants to keep patient. Yes. 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 So I have, I think, connected both. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, uh, so this animal sample tube, uh, uh, is prepared. It's a very um, simple um, thin wall tube. So where this is a solvent, and generally we use a deuterated solvent. Just, 
and this is a chicken lung. And you see here that uh, depending on that uh, magnet, uh, that proton and resonance at different uh, uh, frequency. So this is 900 megahertz. Now the machines are there, but in our department it is just 300 megahertz and our machines. So finally. Yeah, and then this is a magnet. Uh, so then, when uh, we generally chemists used to do that NMR uh, spectroscopy for determining the structure of particular uh, compound, compound, and later this has been uh, used uh, recently uh, for medical purposes. It's actually just an exchange now. This idea of NMR machine, NMR measurement, and this is a magnetic resonance imaging. This magnetic resonance imaging is a uh, medical imaging technique primarily used in radiology to visualize the structure and function of the body. And it provides a detailed image of the body in any plan. MR has much greater soft tissues contrast than compute tomography, making it specially useful for neurological, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, and oncological imaging. So basically, so they, this is actually a proton uh, NMR explorer. Magnetic MRI machine, MRI imaging is basically a proton uh, uh, NMR measure. But here, number of protons are very high, whatever water molecules are there in the tissue. So that is why they developed a uh, software to uh, determine the NMR uh, is uh, do the normal experiment with the uh, water uh, in the body, and finally they could image this uh, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, or oncological imaging. And unlike uh, continuous, uh, uh, with, uh, it was used non-ionizing radiation, but is powerful magnetic field to align the nuclear membranes around the hydrogen atoms in water in the body. And radio frequency fields are used to systematically alter the alignment. Of this mechanism causing the hydrogen nuclei to produce a rotating magnetic field detectable by a scan. So, this signal can be manipulated by additional magnetic fields to build up enough information to reconstruct the image of the body. So, basically, you can see here MRI is just an extension of uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy technique, which has been in the chemistry. Now, it is just changed, and here you can see here. We generally do not uh, measure water, uh, do experiment with water, but always ex do experiment with a proton in a or C13 carbon present in a particular form. And here they do imaging of water. And this is a MRI machine that you know very well, we have seen. And when a person is inside the scanner under the hydrogen nuclear, proton found in abundance in the human human body as water, align with a strong magnetic field. A radio wave adjusts the right frequency for the protons to absorb energy, pushes some of the protons out of the The protons then snap back to elements, producing detectable rotating magnetic field as they do so. Since protons in different areas of the body, for example, fat, muscle, Realign at different speeds, the different structures of the body. So, this is the MRI technique. So, finally, nuclear magnetic resonance was first described and measured in molecular beam by Isidore Ravi in 1938. Eight years later, in 1946, Alex Bloch and Edward Mills Russell refined the technique and used on liquid and solid. For which they share the Nobel Prize in physics. And with this, thank you very much for your time. So I believe that I I, I have given the basic idea of an hour special uh, without doing uh, detail on this topic, so that I believe uh, you could have a glimpse of the animal spectroscopy techniques, which already been studied by you for long before in your uh, textbooks. And thank you very much.
And now, hello. Now it is the uh, time of the participants. Uh, uh, I request uh, the participants uh, to ask some questions. Two questions will be taken by uh, Upan sir. You can directly ask by unmuting your mic. Hello. Is there any question? Yes, yes. The voice is not clear. Uh, uh, voice is not clear. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Continue. Yes. Is continue. It... Hello. Hello. Is it audible? Yeah, yes, hello. Yes. Sir, is it audible? Yes, yes you can ask. Sir, I am uh, Orkutati Mujumdar of uh, BSc 6 M of uh, Kokrasar Government College uh, in Chemistry Honors. And uh, my question to you is, is there any uh, spectroscopical uh, methods or uh, techniques for the structural illustration, sir? No, I am not able to hear. Hello? I am clearly hearing you, sir. Its voices are coming very broken. Then, uh, sir, hello, sir. Uh, he is asking, sir, uh, are you audible? Hello, uh, sir. Am I audible, sir? No, I have clear one at first. Uh, sir, then, then I should write in what to Hagi Bagi and say. Question to uh, Lithuania. Question You can write in the chat box also. Oh. Sir, uh, Fukan, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, he is asking about the uh, elucidation of. Uh, Structure of water. Hello. Hello. Shall we um, close down? Uh, okay, since it is uh, not clear. Sir, uh, I have given the chat box, sir. Sir, I am asking the question. He has written in the chat box. Sir, who is there? Pukon sir. Hello. Hello. No, no. Hello. 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 For structural elucidation of water. <coughs> Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Sir, they have written that question in chat box. See, I got one chart that uh, laser induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy for soil analysis. Actually, this is not uh, uh, NMR spectroscopy. So, my I am discussing mostly on the NMR spectroscopy only. So. So basically, LIBS is an atomic emission spectroscopy. So, which uh, actually um, I'm not covering today with this NMR uh, spectroscopy. NMR, uh, my talk. So, it is uh, different uh, from the NMR spectroscopy. So obviously, this is not uh, in the domain of the NMR spectroscopy. So, basically, it's an atomic emission spectroscopy. It's a uh, laser pulse only, it is used, and here we don't use that. Secondly, 
Uh, how can we dis, uh, this uh, spectroscopic technique structural elucidation of water? Generally, we do not use mostly spectroscopy, this particular spectroscopy, animal spectroscopy for structural elucidation of water, mostly crystallography and other uh, laser techniques. Those techniques are generally used for uh, structural elucidation of water. And water structure is very well known. So, so those are used, not NMR. Of course, that the water molecule stays in the body, whatever present in the body is uh, generally uh, analyzed using um, MRI. <coughs> Nitrogen generally we do not do in soil analysis. So it, depending on the nitrogen uh, content uh, in the soil analysis, uh, organic nitrogen. So you, you first determine the in soil analysis, generally we have organic compounds you can uh, extract from the soil water, soil sample. Then it's simple to identify the nitrogen. Okay, thank you, sir. And soil thank analysis, obviously, Mainly atomic absorption spectroscopy is used for soil analysis. So say for example, um, elements present in soil, generally we use atomic spectroscopy, then uh, a flame photometry, those are used generally for soil analysis. So generally we do not use NMR spectroscopy unless we isolate some compounds, particularly which can be, uh, 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 structure can be determined using NMR. Otherwise generally metals, generally we do not, uh, Determine because soil sample generally, if there is a, of course, in soil sample, if there is a organic matter present in soil samples, then obviously we extract, then we uh, do the CMAS and all other techniques we uh, do, do you, then finally we determine what are the organic molecules, organic compounds present in soil. And that other metallic contents, obviously, it can be done using uh, atomic addition spectroscopy, flame photometry. And then other aspects. And even if you do the EDX of the uh, uh, electro dispersed X ray technique in uh, SEM, standing electron microscope, there also you can determine the elements in the sample uh, in a soil. So, generally, those techniques are used for uh, making soil. And also, of course, you have to do X ray and other spectroscopy techniques which they use to analyze soils, but not the animal. Until unless you isolate some compounds and it can dissolve or you can do of course solid state NMR. Then otherwise we do not use NMR for analyzing soils. Is it fine? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think all the participants has uh, got their answers. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you again, sir, for your uh, valuable space and presentation. I think yeah. our students and participants will be highly benefited from this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So now we'll move to the second part of this sure. uh, seminar. Uh, now, uh, among with us, we have Dr. Uh, Komales Prasad. I like to request uh, Dr. Moinul Hock of the Chemistry Department of Okrada Government College to introduce Dr. Komales Prasad. Please. Hello. Yeah. So it is the time for our second research person. <laughs> Dr. Komlesh Prasad. Before starting his speech, just I would like to say a few lines about Dr. Prasad. Dr. Komlesh Prasad, born in Sipsagar district, Assam. He completed his BSc from Science College, Zuhat an MSc in Dibrugo University. He is currently working as a senior principal scientist and divisional head in the natural products and green chemistry division of Central Salt and Marine Chemicals Research Institute, Bhavanagar, Gujarat, India. He is also working as a professor in the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, SCSIR, a spin-off for Human Resource Development and Training Center. Dr. Prashad is the recipient of CSIR Young Scientist Award in 2010 for his contribution in the research 
in the field of polysaccharides. She is also a recipient of Distinguished Lectureship Award 2019 by Japan Chemical Society. His current research interests are biomass processing using new solvent system polysaccharides and their modification and natural product chemistry. He published 108 research articles in the international reputed journals and 10 book chapters. He is also a co inventor of 18 international patents. His students have achieved PhD degree under his guideship. He visited as a resource person in a number of foreign countries like Japan, UK, France, and Germany. And these are a few lines about Dr. Prasad. Now I would request Dr. Kamlesh Prasad to deliver his believable speech. Thank you. Am I audible right now? Can yes, you? Yes, audible. Audible and visible, both are. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, just let me share my screen first. Can you see the screen? Not yet. Ah, oh, now yes. 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 Okay. So at the outset, uh, thank you very much the organizing committee uh, for giving me opportunity to talk uh, some of my research work in front of all of you, especially the students. And I'm really thankful to Dr. Mainul Hak, my good friend from Tirugur University and for inviting me for this uh, webinar. And uh, before I just start my talk, and I just would like to introduce CSIR because for this, this is for the students who may be not aware about CSIR, but CSIR is, it is Council of Scientific Industrial Research with uh, its headquarters in New Delhi. So you can see there are 37 laboratories all over India is there uh, under CSIR. And we cover the all the almost all the domains of um, sciences, for example, biological science, chemical science, engineering, and information and physics as well. And more than 3,000 scientists are working in CSIR at this point of time. And basically, CSIR is a registered society under uh, Society Act 1940. And Prime Minister of India is our president uh, of the society. And Science and Technology Minister is the vice president. So this is about our institute. Uh, you may not have heard about uh, CSM CRI. It is Central Salt and Brand Chemical Research Institute. It is in the west part of the country in Gujarat. It's okay. Is it okay? Okay, okay, okay. Continue. Okay. So this is our institute, which was inaugurated in 1954. And you can see that uh, among all the research areas, seaweed is a very important research area which our institute is carrying out. You know, you know, uh, yeah. Hello. Bhavnagar is uh, only 14 kilometers away from the sea. So we have a very big uh, and long coastal line in Gujarat, not only in Gujarat, in, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu also. So we are exploiting the seaweed resources, for example, seaweeds. You can see that these are the, some of the seaweeds. You may not might not have seen many of your seaweeds, but this is the seaweeds who is being cultivated by our yeah, it is a um, it, it is a French station of our institute in Tamil Nadu, it's called Mandapam. So they are doing the cultivation and all these things. 
and you can see this is our department uh, as i told uh, i should tell that analytical chemistry which is a topic of today's um, webinar it is very important research area uh, for all the chemistry domains uh, for this reason our institute is having a very strong analytical and environmental science division with centralized internationally almost almost all the instruments are there in the facility and this facility is mostly used for the research in the area of natural product in the innovating materials in the in the salts and in the plant omics then they use this research area for the different membrane science and all this then this is a uh, one slide we just uh, want to uh, share with all of you about the positioning of csr among the world organizations in uh, by schemigo institute ranking so csr was placed in top 500 in 2018 and among csm uh, among csr our csm cri is the number 2 after csr ncl so there is the way the performance of our csm cri is quite good in terms of research publications societal missions as well as from consultants point of view So, so we actually mostly in CSR. What do we do? You do a lot of uh, technological oriented work apart from the basic research. So we develop a lot of products, and these products uh, normally they go to the market, and a lot of entrepreneurs come to us. They they, uh, they take the technology from us, and they start selling this product in the market. So these are some of the products. I'm just showing some of the pictures that how these products reach to the market, and for. This is some research. I am. You must have heard about company like High Media. So this company is working with us, and they are going to take our technology on agar. Agar is a seaweed polysaccharide, uh, which is used for the mostly for the gel electrophoresis and DNA separation. So that type of products. And one more product you can just see. It is a, a seaweed biostimulant. Biostimulant means uh, these are seaweed. By you get this from seaweed, and this biostimulant, if you put on such uh, crops. The yield of the crops increases, so therefore we call it plant biostimulants. And this biostimulant also has been developed. And this uh, technology is again has been transferred to a lot of uh, companies, and they are they are marketing the products in the market. So these are the photographs where I am showing it's a sense of uh, satisfaction that your research is reaching to the public, and which for we are meant for. So this is uh, some slides and. So let me start my talk because I am not going to tell you the basic things because already uh, Fukan sir has already covered lot of basic uh, things in NMR. So I am just uh, trying to tell you how we have used the analytical tools for our research. Here I am going to mention some of the instruments, uh, very advanced techniques which uh, we are uh, we have used for the research in natural product chemistry using seaweeds, polysaccharides, seaweeds. Okay. So here left hand side you are able to see a photograph. This is the seaweed. This seaweed name is Cocacus elvirae. So this is a red class of seaweed. So there are three types of seaweeds are available: red, green, and brown, depending on the pigments present in it. So these seaweeds, when you are mechanically expelled, because these seaweeds contain a lot of water inside, so these waters are very rich in uh, nutrients. So when we expel this uh, water from this, we get a liquid. This liquid we call it sap. Okay. So this sap, sap. when our some of our agricultural scientists they try to uh, on various plants so you can see in the left hand side lot of plants brinjal okra onion banana cotton and others so they found that the increase in the crop yield by 32 to around 20 to 36% mostly they have increased so this is the interesting thing for the first time we observed in 2006 so then we tried to understand what exactly the reason why this sap is increasing the yield and plant crop as well so this is the reason why we started doing research on the sap and then we first we tried to analyze the plant grow, uh, the plant micro and macronutrients present in the sap so in the left hand side you can see some of the plant micronutrients sodium potassium magnesium phosphorus etc so in some of the steps when these are not present also the plants are giving a result so there was an idea to identify some plant growth hormones inside the plants so you know uh, if you have heard about plant growth hormones the plant growth hormones are the very important metabolites present in the plants so these plants uh, they help the plants uh, in the budding of the plants flowering of the plants in the root strengthening of the plants and the uh, leaf size of the plants so they help in all these activities of the plant and they are broadly classified in three set, uh, three categories one is called actin one is called cytokine and one is called gibberellin so in auxin there are many chemical compounds i have just mentioned three of them indole free acetic acid indole butyric acid indole free propionic acid so these are some sort of auxin then for cytokine under cytokine kinetin gatin benzoamino purin derivatives so these are called the cyano uh, cytokines and gibberellin there are almost 54 different types of gibberellins are there and then been named as ga3 ga4 ga5 like this 
so these are the basic uh, plant growth hormones which are present in the uh, seaweeds you can say even in the terrestrial plants also they present so we started doing our research to identify this particular plant growth hormones in the sap so what we did as you know in the chemistry when you go to the laboratory the first thing what you do you do the tlc prep so if you any unknown compound any unknown compound you want to analyze so first you have to extract the extract it in some polar or non polar uh, uh, solvents depending on the nature of the molecules which you are targeting okay so in this case we have extracted uh, oxygen using diethyl ether and dichloromethane then cytokine by n butanol and tiberylene by ethyl acetate okay so once we get the extract we now started identifying the molecules so what we did for the first time we use a tlc tlc is the basic uh, tool which every chemist use in the laboratory and the first thing from the rf factor uh, iteration factor you come to know about the presence of some of the molecules or compound in the extract okay this is the very beginning of the research then let us then we move little bit because we want to get a complete structure of the molecules because that was very unknown before we started our research then we started doing uv visible spectrophotometer so uv visible spectrophotometer you know it is another basic very basic instrument which almost all the laboratories are having nowadays so here what happen uh, the analytes which come force are being detected by the uv light so uv light is mostly you know from 200 to 800 uv visible region and 400 to 800 is visible 200 to 400 nm nanometer is a uv region so in the uv region normally the detection is very very difficult so to make the any analyte detectable we have to develop some color into the because visible range is always considered to be the best uh, area or detection for any uv visible spectrophotometer so we try to develop the color in the oxygen by using felling reagents in felling reagents we get around blue uh, we get around pink color of the oxygen so this detected and after detection and for any detection or quantification in by any instrument you have to prepare a standard curve because without a standard curve you cannot uh, you cannot able to identify because uv is not going to give you any peak area it gives us only absorbance of the molecules or compounds present in the um, in the system So what we did, we prepare a standard uh, graph using a standard compound of mineral acetic acid, and here and then from the unknown absorption, we fit into the um, into the standard graph, and we are able to get the concentration of oxygen as a 23.4 ppm. Okay, so here we are not getting the molecule. Here we are we getting the broad area, broad because it gives a very broad peak. So it, it, this gives a broad idea about oxygen. Oxygen. So we don't know what oxygen is present. now again similarly we go to cytokinins in cytokinins also again we are tried to identify a uv visible spectrophotometer using the um, phantom reagent so here again we able to get idea about the presence of cytokinin total cytokinin it is 77.28 ppm okay so oxygen total oxygen total cytokinin idea we got next we try to identify g carolins so the develop the color and then here we able to get a total idea of gibaldi here we not able to know who which gibaldi is present now a very basic common idea basic idea it is gibaldi is present okay then oxygen total oxygen total cytokinin total gibaldi is three things now come to our mind so next what to do now now next instrument we have to use the next basic instrument which has to be used for any water soluble molecules is hplc high performance liquid chromatography okay uh, so first we use tlc then we improve our research to uv visible then we started doing hplc now what happens with hplc so hplc there are mostly there are two types of hplc one is reverse phase you spill kali ki bilana hele re then ke pahare pahari sana na hello kali to ahana tumi moi to bahut dilika khatra sa sa to gaso i think The the, the mic should be muted. Hello. Hello, Bhavan sir. Please. Oh, uh, hello. Please mute them. Mute no, them. Hello. Oh, okay. Okay. Then uh, then we come to HPLC. So what HPLC we do? HPLC normally you have to develop a method based on the solvent system. There are two solvent system normally used. And there are two types of modes are used in HPLC in reverse phase HPLC. One is called isocratic mode. One is called gradient mode. in hpl in in asocratic mode what happen you have, you have the fixed quantity of 
solvent goes into the column. So normally the columns is a stationary phase having C18. Normally we use C18 column here. So and C6, C18, C15, C19, a lot of columns are available with the stationary phase of different different structures. So here C18 we have used and we develop a gradient uh, solvent systems. So this is the gradient solvent system, uh, the formula or the program we have developed for the detection of the plant growth hormone in the cell. And then we started recording the SPLC. Okay. SPLC, the good thing about SPLC, you know, SPLC, when you run a standard compound, for example, indolacetic acid, so you get a peak like this, and then we get a peak area under the peak area. So this peak area is fixed for some amount of the analyte. You can say, the, for example, uh, the, the loop area, the loop volume, which uh, the SPLC we run is 0 0.5, 50 microliter. It is 0 0.05 ml. So in 0 0.05 ml, some amount of indolacetic acid is present. Then we run the sample with an unknown extract where the, we don't know how much indolacetic acid is present. Then we run it and we found some retention time which is similar to the retention of the standards. So this we have collected and we then find the area with this under this particular because the natural uh, SEP or natural systems, they have a lot of other things are present along with uh, the in uh, uh, our target molecule. So here we have, we you can see we, we get a lot of other peaks, but our interest of the peak was this. And we then tried to find out how much indolacetic acid or oxygen is present. So we quantified it. Then again with the same thing we did with um, cytokinin, GATN and canadine. But the biggest problem we encountered with the cytokinin is that the GATN and canadine both are having almost same retention time. So they are eluting at the almost at the same time. You know the SPLC, the elution depends on the polarity of the molecules. So lower, the lower, lower is the polarity, higher first it will elute in the uh, from the column. So in this case, the both the compounds, G18 and canadine, they started eluting simultaneously, though it was very difficult to identify which one is for which. So again, here we come to know about cytokine. So our idea to find out the individual molecule is still not sold. Even from TLC, we got a rough idea. From UV, we get a total idea of this thing. And from HPLC, from oxygen, indolacetic acid was somehow detected, but a cytokine it was impossible to detect because the uh, illusion time of both the cytokine was same. So again, we had detected it and we quantified it. Then, specifically in the case of gibraltin GA3. So in the GA3, we use the standard for GA3. So mostly because the, all the seaweeds are reported to contain GA3 other, rather than other uh, gibraltins. So we were able to find some of the peaks for the GA3. And this was again quantified by with respect to the area of the standard GA3 under the same condition obtained and with the unknown GA3 under the same condition obtained. So this by way we are able to get some peak area uh, with the peak area we are able to get around 30.39 ppm of uh, GA3 is present. Okay. Okay, now since uh, our problem is still not solved because our aim was to find the individual molecules and uh, now we started doing our research with the mass facility. The mass spectrometry is the one of the advanced uh, technology which give us mass fragmentation and we have also used tandem mass spectrometry. So the MSMS we call it in a general term. So this instrument is used to identify the molecules. So how, what we did? This is uh, just uh, for the students I'm telling what mass basically do. The mass instrument which we are having is a ESI type. ESI means electro spray ionization. So here the things are ionized. Ionization means whatever you give in a solvent, they get ionized. So they manage the mass, they sort the molecule on the base of the molecular weight, the sorting of the done by the mass analyzer and finally this get detected. So in, in, uh, in details, if you uh, want to tell you, you can say in the mass, there is a Taylor cone is there. Here is the cone look like this and it has a budding and here is the spray. So where we give a sample here in this class, we put the sample and this sample is normally put by a capillary. So very, very thin capillaries are there where the sample goes to the uh, Taylor cone and from the Taylor cone it gets sprayed. Okay. So in the uh, mass, it is mostly in the inside the mass, it is a big, uh, it is a huge vacuum is created. So in the vacuum, again, we give some heat. So when you give a heat, so the droplets, uh, when you evaporate the solvent, the so droplets comes out and they are separated into many droplets. You can say it is a fission of the droplets to space. And this fission of the droplets, when you give some electric field, they move 
from one place to the detector. So here, how they moves? How this, this is the way they moves. So this is the time of flight of mass analyzer. So that is equal to TOF. The TOF technology we are using in the mass spectrometer. So you can see in the left hand side, these ions are there, which are under some electric field. So in the electric field, we are giving the lines, and this. And the ions of the same charge have the same kinetic energy, okay? But but they will move with depend on the molecular weight. So the drift region is free of drift because this is a drift region. So there is no electric field here. So the molecular the uh, the masses the small masses will move faster to the detector. And the way this is the way how it is getting detected depending on the molecular weight of the uh, molecules it is get detected so first fragmentation takes place basically in, in the case of here it is not fragmentation it is ionization okay so we are doing our research uh, we have extracted the plant growth hormones uh, from the liquid it is a seaweed shape and then we start doing then you but uh, you know that the liquids uh, as i told you it contains a lot of other things so you have to purify the liquid first so purification in the chemistry mostly is done by column chromatography and by filtration okay so we perform both the things using a silica column of 40 60 mass size and then you used uh, some um, uh, filter papers of size 0.2 micron ptfe filter paper is called and then this particular colorless extract or analysis comes out will be directly injected into the mass, okay? Well, now this is uh, the pattern you can say. Uh, this is ESIMS study of the organic extracts and for example, the organic extracts of indolistic acid. So here you can see, uh, we are getting a ESI electron spray mass in the negative mode. Negative mode in the, because there's two, two modes, you have to run the ESI. One is positive uh, ESI, one is negative ESI. Depending upon the structure, you are going to Analyze. So since it is a carboxylic acid uh, containing molecule, so a negative uh, mode is used because the fragmentation pattern is always possible for the acids in a negative mode only. So here you get the molecular weight. The molecular weight of uh, indolacetic acid is 174, 175, and here we are getting a molecular ion peak around 174. And 174, we are getting 174, not 175, because in negative mode you get the molecular weight with m minus h so one hydrogen lesser than the molecular ion okay so m minus h and then you get a data ion peak so this data ion peak is the characteristic peaks of any molecule so if suppose in the if i run the standard indolacetic acid in the mass spectrometer and suppose i get a fragmentation like this for any molecule so it does not mean that that molecule is uh, is indolacetic acid. We have to again fragment the molecular ion peak here. So we again fragment this 174. This is by MSMS, but tandem mass spectrometry. So we get uh, two fragmentation. This is a very distinct fragmentation. You see, we are not getting any other fragmentation, but only two distinct fragmentation. One is molecular ion peak fragmentation, one is the data ion peak. So one data ion peak is 130. So now if you get 174 and 130 and the mass abundance is almost 25%. Uh, for the uh, molecular ion peak in respect to uh, retro ion peak, then you can confirmly say that this is the molecule which you are looking for. So this gives us a exact um, idea about the molecule. It is indolacetic acid by st studying the molecular fragmentation pattern. Okay. Similarly, uh, we detected kinetin. So kinetin, the molecular fragmentation pattern is 216, 148, 136. This is the, you can say that is the fingerprinting of the molecule. So this, uh, if you are able to get the, this fragmentation pattern, you can see, confirmly say that this is kinetin. Similarly, for zeatin, the fragmentation pattern is 220 and 136. So this we have established using the mass spectrometry. Okay, so this is again for the GA3. So GA3, there is only two magnetism patterns coming. One is 345. It is, you see here we have written M plus H. So because the structure is having OH group. So when some molecule you are targeting having OH group, then you have to use the ESI plus. For example, in carboxylic acid, you have to use negative mode. And for any OH group you want to, uh, want to analyze, you have to use the negative, uh, positive mode for the analysis of the mass spectrometer. So this is how uh, we identified the molecules. And then the next question come out, how to quantify? Because identification is one part, then quantification is another part, because both things are important to make an idea about how much um, indolacetic acid or uh, indol 
uh, other um, cytokines, for example, G18 is present or how much G3 is present. So to do this, what we, we have developed a new method, which uh, nobody's reported uh, before we have done it. Uh, we use the mass spectrometer for quantification as well, because as you know, in SPLC, it was difficult to quantify as because it is eluting at the same time. So, in a ma but mass, we get a distinct uh, mass fragmentation pattern for the molecules. So here we have done um, the um, the intensity of the ions, and here we have to use an internal standard. So internal standard is a molecule which is almost having the same skeleton with that of the uh, your target molecule. For example, indole acetic acid, that uh, it is the skeleton and indole propionic acid. Skeleton is the same. So indole propionic acid we have used as a uh, internal standard for detection of indole acetic acid. So again, like the similar to UV, we have to prepare a, a standard graph here. So a standard graph was just depend on the ratio of the intensity of indole acetic acid and indole propionic acid, and it is a mass ratio of indole acetic acid. In, and so this is the ratio we got and with the r square below 0 0.99 this is the excellent graph when you get a, uh, r square near to one so you can consider the graph is uh, one of the best graph for any quantification so with this quantification we have uh, tried to do it g18 um, then we try to kinetin and with almost with accuracy we able to quantify the this thing at these values were almost lesser than what we have detected by uv and hplc because here we able to detect the particular molecule not a como as a as a series uh, as a uh, class of molecule so this is what uh, the gat was quantified coming around 29 to 23.97 ppm and gibberellin was also quantified by this method and it was coming around 27.90 ppm so this is uh, the the reason for telling all this that uh, the method we have developed is uh, no derivation required because if you want to quantify or if you want to do analyze something by gcms so you have to derivatize the molecule so any carboxylic group has to be converted into esters to get done by gcms but in this case particular case we are not derivatizing our any molecules direct method for the quantification individual pictures could be Pigeons with plant growth hormones or plant growth regulators can be identified. And quantification of pigeons present in a trace amount was possible by using this sodium standard. The total time required was reduced. So this is the what uh, discovery or we can say finding we got from this model. So now I'll just tell you some of the basic research which uh, I am we are doing in our research group. Uh, mostly we are working on DNA. So you know DNA is a genetic molecule and it is responsible for uh, taking your um, genetic codes from one generation to another generation. But DNA is a very good molecule for the material research. But the problem with DNA is that it is uh, very, very unstable in external environment. If you change the pH of a, of a solvent, it will break the DNA. If you increase the temperature, it will break the DNA. If you change the conductivity, it will change, uh, break down. So it is very, very delicate molecule. So, but since uh, our target is to use DNA for materials, so we have to make DNA a tough molecule. This means DNA should be stable at temperature, down, then only it can be used for any type of research. So to do this, uh, what uh, we develop some any liquids, and here uh, I'll just, I'll not talk about anything else, but the instrumentation which is very useful identifying the structure of DNA. So here you can see, uh, the first thing you have to use, FTIR, this is a very basic uh, analytical tool. And then you see, Fugansar has told about NMR, proton NMR, count NMR. But in case of DNA, it has a phosphate chain. So you have to identify the phosphate chain. So here we have used 31 P phosphorus. It is phosphorus NMR. So phosphorus NMR is another NMR technique where it is the instrument is same, but only you have to use the nucleus of phosphorus. H3PO4 normally it is used. So that uh, with this respect to this, you are able to see whether the structure of DNA is remain intact or not in the solvent system. So we are able to, and another very important instrument we use for detection of the structure of DNA, it is CD spectrometer. The CD means circular dichrism spectrometer. So circular dichrism spectrometer is a so excellent experiment. experiment. Uh, this gives us an idea about the B form of the DNA. V form of DNA means DNA is normally present in the double helical form. So in a double helical form, mostly we get two peaks. One is a negative peak around 240 or 243 and one to 78. So this, this 2 to 78 correspond to the helicity of the DNA. And this particular, this, uh, this negative 
is correspond to the base pair pecking or pi pi pecking in the base pair. So these two things are kept together. If any disturbances you find in these two places, the DNA has lost its structure. Okay. So this is and the UV spectrophotometry is again important uh, instrument which can tell you the stability of DNA. So just you have to measure the absorption at a two wavelength. One is what 280, one is 260. Get a ratio. If you get a ratio of 1.89, the DNA is intact. So there is no breaking of DNA. So in the latter case, if you see here, the DNA is broken. So the the ratio of 1, 260 to 280 goes down to 1.6. So it means then we try to develop some new techniques and new um, ionic liquids, which are bio based ionic liquids, such that this ion liquids. And again, once we develop the solvent, you have to see the structure. The, another, this is another analytical technique, you can say gel electrophoresis. So, in the gel electrophoresis, what they do, they run the DNA in, uh, in presence of uh, in, a, in a agar plate and they see the movement. So if it breaks, so it is broken. So if it is not breaking, it means it is remained intact. Okay. So this is another analytical technique. You can say it is a molecular docking technique. We call it. So molecular docking technique is used to find out uh, how the interaction is taking place. So in the DNA, there is two places where the interaction can take. One is called major group. One is called minor group. So we try to understand where the binding is taking place, whether it is minor group binding or major, which is found at mostly in any liquids with the cations having hydroxy type. So the binding is always taking place at the minor group. Okay. So this is again uh, this photographs you can see here the CD spectrophotometry is spectroscopy spectroscopic images. As so here we try to see the DNA st stability in different temperature 4 to 75 degree and in different pHs with 4.228. So how they are means the basic idea is to tell you that how they are uh, stable or not in different solvents. So there are some instruments which are exclusively used for this type of research for. Pro and here one instrument uh, figure you can see here in the lower part and this is uh, the flow behavior so you must have know about viscosity but this is a little bit higher than viscosity it's called shear viscosity so this is mostly done by rheometer so in rheometer what we do uh, any gelling compound or any viscous compound when because the viscosity depends on the molecular weight and we do the rheological behavior to determine the flow behavior because mostly if you get any polymer solution or biopolymer they're mostly they're non-Newtonian in nature. So non-Newtonian in nature means with shear rate their viscosity is changes you know, from higher to lower. So they are called non-Newtonian behavior. So with the non-Newtonian behavior, it's really shear behavior. You can tell about the nature of the molecules uh, or the um, of the solutions and viscoelastic elastic behavior will tell us about the elasticity of the how how is it okay? Uh, Five minutes, it's okay. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Please continue, sir. Okay. So this is the rheometer. I'm just trying to tell the student about uh, the Hello. Okay. Then this is another uh, another technique. Another technique is called scanning electromagnet. SEM. So SEM is such an instrument. Here you can study the surface behavior of the compounds or the composites or any materials you prepare, and you are able to see the distribution. Because suppose you mix two or three things and it is reacted. So how to see where they distributed or not? So the way you have to study the distribution using SEM, is scanning electron microscope. So with the scanning electron microscope, you can tell where the molecules are binded. For example, here we have bound DNA with titanium. Okay and with iron. So we are able to see how it is binded, bound, and then we done the AFM. It is atomic force microscopic images. So AFM will give you a three-dimensional structure of the uh, compounds or the composites or the molecules. So here you are able to see the whether the structure is three-dimensional is stable or not. So here you are able to see that structure using uh, AFM. Similarly for this type of research, the FCM AFM is very, very important. And this is the uh, instrument I'm telling you. This is the uh, spectra using it is a single crystal spectrometer. This is uh, the two uh, x rays you know, one is quarter x ray, quarter x ray, one is single crystal x ray. So, single extra crystal will give you the exact structure of the crystals which have formed any of this thing. Okay. And, and uh, so, I'll not uh, tell much about the. Uh, uh, I would like to finish my talk uh, by thanking my collaborators from all over the, uh, some of the countries for lecture and uh, uh, generosity,
and my students uh, which have done they have done PhD with me and they are the pillar of my research so and these some of the students are working i am very thankful to all of them and thank you very much for all of to all of you for listening to this talk and thank you very much this is our institute looks like okay thank you very much okay uh, now uh, i request the participants to uh, put few questions to dr kamlesh prasad sir if anyone want to ask a question uh, you can ask directly to our वॉइस इज नॉट क्लियर Please, please, I, please send. Uh, please write your question in the chat box. In the meantime, I want to uh, say that uh, one of our participant uh, asked one question to our uh, formless professor. Sir. Uh, he is Krishna Das from I think from his GC College, Tilchor. Uh, he just. Ask a question to you. Can external users avail the LCMS facility from your institute? Yes. Means, yes, yes. They can very well, very well avail the facility. And for the students, seventy-five uh, percent discount we give in the uh, payment term. So it is very cheap for the students. Yeah. Another question uh, to you from one Gaurav of Das. How can we characterize soil organic sample with the help of uh, P thirty one NMS? yeah it is i think soil you have a target molecule is there with you suppose you have a, you know about a target molecule so you can definitely analyze any thing with any instrument so but you have you should get a idea about the molecules which you are going to target for example soils they contains lot of microbes mostly and there's a lot of metals are there so for metals as focus uh, are told as has to be used atomic force microscope as atomic uh, absorption microscopy just, uh, then uh, for the other uh, molecules for the other microbes so for example you want to see the organic uh, molecules inside the soil so you have to use the nmr so but you have, you should know the which molecule you are targeting some proteins you are targeting then you have to go for multitoff instrument which are attached with the ms okay and if you are looking for the small molecules for less than molecular weight you can say 500 then nmr is the best instrument to detect the molecules okay thank you sir uh, your uh, for your valuable and presentation i think uh, our student as well as uh, the research scholars and the faculty will be benefited from your piece now we have uh, come to the end of the uh, program uh, now uh, i request one of our faculty dr suresh kumar nath uh, to present vote of thanks hello everyone am i audible yes yes, yes. Okay, thank you, for, sir, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our uh, principal, Madam Dr. Bonamina Bromo, for encouraging us uh, organize this seminar. And then I would like to thank uh, our Anjali Madam, uh, IK coordinator, IK uh, for giving uh, or for for. Uh, uh, technical support as well as uh, uh, help in all the way uh, for this uh, organizing this webinar and then i would uh, uh, like to thank our uh, sir uh, sir pradeep kumar pan sir we are very much glad to learn from uh, you again uh, as a teacher in this webinar uh, you have given a very uh, nice to be in Uh, certainly, it will benefit our participants. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, your time uh, that you have managed uh, from your busy schedule. 
then uh, i would like to thank uh, dr komolesh prasad sir for giving a nice talk on uh, analytical uh, because you have uh, told us uh, how we can analyze a natural compound how we can uh, see what are the present uh, what are the different types of chemicals present there uh, by using this spectroscopic techniques thank you so much sir then uh, i would like to uh, thank our uh, head of the department of chemistry and uh, our faculty member dr monil hok sir for taking lots of trouble to organize this event and at the same time i would like to thank uh, faculty members of our department for support us next i uh, our sincere thanks goes to mr liladhar sohan assistant professor of physics and also the member of iqsc who have been helping in all the way our sincere thanks goes to the technical team of Kuprasar. I would like to thank all the participants from different institutions who have. I hope you have enjoyed. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Again, success. Thank you. So, thank you, Suresh Nath, uh, uh, for presenting the vote of thanks. Uh, now, again, uh, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to uh, our resource part persons, particularly uh, Professor Pradeep Pukon sir and Dr. Kamalesh Prasad sir, our principal madam. IPSC coordinator, the technical support team, and particularly uh, Mr. Leela Dorsohan, assistant professor, uh, Department of Physics, and uh, the faculties of uh, Department of Chemistry, particularly Dr. Moinul Hawk, Dr. Suresh Nath, and all other faculties. Thank you again. And in the meantime, to the participants, I want to uh, say one thing that uh, your feedback from Feedback link is already given in the chat box. Uh, you kindly fill up the feedback form. And on uh, filling up the feed feedback form, you will get the uh, e-certificate. So uh, with this, uh, I want to conclude this program. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.